Welcome to Living Free Today, a ministry of Cornerstone Fellowship in San Lorenzo, California. These podcasts are the weekly sermons of Dr. Michael L. Wilson. If you would open your Bibles, please, to Psalm 115. Psalm 115 is the third of the Egyptian praise psalms, the third of the six psalms that are read at every Passover. Psalm 115 does have a, we might say, place in history. If you know your history at all, you know that there was a guy named King Henry IV And he was king of England. Shakespeare wrote about him, and he's also in your history books. So depending on where you were educated, you might have heard of this guy. And he was the king of England from 1399 to 1413. He had a son that was, when he was born, was called Hal. And when Prince Hal, before he became king... King Henry IV came to him and gave him Psalm 115, verse 1. Now, gave it to him in Latin because the only Bible you could get back then was the Vulgate, which was in Latin. It'd be another 150 years or so until there would be an English Bible. But no problem, the classic educated Henry family, he knew Latin. And he saw, not to us, O Lord, not to us, but to your name give glory for the sake of your steadfast love and your faithfulness, and who would become King Henry V vowed to make this a guide for his rulership. He vowed to rule England with this as the standard, that he would not gain glory that he would not seek glory for his country, but he would always seek glory for God. Now, King Henry V was born into the midst of what has been known as the Hundred Year War between England and France. And so he got his army together and sailed over to France to continue the battle and to conquer France. At that time, France was in a difficult situation almost a civil war, and so instead of one unified country to defend, there were many different provinces, and so it was, some people would say, fairly easy to take over sections of France. The last and greatest battle was the Battle of Agincourt, and on October 25th, 1415, which is St. Crispin's Day, And if you read Shakespeare, you know about St. Crispin's Day. It is a Catholic sort of holiday. They gathered against the French. And this thing happened and that thing happened. And it's a very interesting, if you want to see how God's hand was certainly in the battle. The British won with very few uh, losses and the French were routed. And when it was all over and, the, and King Henry V gathered his surviving army, they kneeled in the mud and they sang a hymn in Latin with the first line is, Not to us, O Lord, not to us, but to your name give glory for the sake of your steadfast love and your faithfulness. And so the promise to rule with this verse in mind was true throughout of all of Henry V's life. And this story and the story of this verse is in Shakespeare's plays about Henry's. And it is also in the archives and you can Wikipedia it and all that kind of stuff. It is a well-known fact of history that this king sought no glory for himself. And the response of God seems to be, He was the greatest military king of England during the medieval times. And it's all portrayed in a movie called Henry V with Laurence Olivier playing King Henry. And it's a well done movie. I don't know if it's on Netflix or whatever. You can see it, but it's well acted and is acting out the 
the Shakespeare play. And God is throughout. It is considered King Henry V to be a very strong Christian and to promote Christian teaching in his kingdom. And it is understood now looking back that his attempt to conquer France was because in his mind it was a pagan nation. It was not a Christian nation and he was expanding the kingdom of God is kind of how he saw it. And so that's an interesting way to look at it. And as I said, this is also the third of the six Passover psalms. Psalm 113 and 114 would have been read or sung or chanted before the main meal. This would have been read right after the main meal with the other three to follow. And it starts out, Not to us, O Lord, not to us, but to your name give glory for the sake of your steadfast love and your faithfulness. And the idea of me being a sort of person or you being a sort of person who will not seek your own glory, but whatever you do, you will always advance the kingdom of God, you will always advance God's glory is a strange idea today. There are very, in fact, I'll say there's none. There's nobody in the public eye who is not seeking their own glory. Everybody on either side and at every level is in many ways seeking their own glory. And as we are in an election year, it is understood by everybody who is running at every level that name recognition is how people vote these days. If I recognize your name, I will put a check mark next to it as opposed to who's that? I won't put a check mark next to that. And so advancing name recognition by default will advance self-glorification because most people when they advance name recognition will want people to remember good things about that name, will remember people to understand, hey, that person, you know, built roads or kept the water clean or two chickens in every pot or whatever promise they're making these days. The idea that I need to look at XYZ and say, oh yeah, XYZ I heard did this, this, and this. I'm going to put a check mark next to them. And so the idea of glorifying God and a leader glorifying God is a, is a strange and distant memory, it seems, at least in this country. The idea that God appoints everybody from president down to dog catcher. Romans 13 is clear if they have authority that includes police, that includes military. If they have authority over you, God put them there and God is lending or giving them his authority to function. And it's very easy, it seems, with today's uh, information everywhere where a politician can speak to 100 million people instantly. They don't have to wait until... The train comes to town and then people ride a horse several miles to see the debate. You can see the debate on your phone. You can see the debate on TV. You can see it on your computer. You can see anything they're talking about pretty much on any device. I remember many years ago, every year, the president, whoever it might be, has the obligation of giving a State of the Union speech. And I remember many years ago when President Obama was giving his second, I was driving to San Jose, and I had my phone on the dashboard, and my phone came on, and there he was giving his speech. I didn't even look for it. I didn't even turn it on. They had pushed it out, it seems, the State of the Union to anybody who had an internet connection at that time. And that is the state that we are in today. It is very easy for people with money to hire the right people and push out their message 
and to get it into everybody's hands. And nobody is saying, don't glorify me, glorify God. Not unto me, but under, unto God and his kingdom. And so this is a bit out of place, we might say. But personally, I think that we have an opportunity in whatever you're doing, since I don't think anybody here is running for president, whatever you're doing in your life, you do have the opportunity to glorify yourself, whether it be on Facebook or in your family or whatever. You have the opportunity of saying, look how great I am. Or you have the opportunity of saying, not to us, not to us, O oh Lord, but to your name give glory. And we've talked before about God's name. God's name is his program. God's name is his kingdom. We need to be advancing God's kingdom. And from the world's point of view, we need to be considered inconsequential to God's plan. God knows all and knows what we do. And God will reward the work we do. But we don't seek fame in the world to advance God's kingdom, I think is the watchword that we have today for that. There are people where we know their name and not their church's name. One classic example is, is Robert Schuller, who's no longer a pastor. I don't know if he's still alive. But Robert Schuller had the Crystal Cathedral. Remember the Crystal Cathedral in Garden Grove, California, Everybody knew Robert Schuller in the hour of power. I haven't met anybody who knows the actual name of the church. The actual name of the church is the first Dutch Reformed Church of Garden Grove, California. Nobody would have guessed that he's a Dutch Reformed pastor, but he was. But he, had, he advanced his program, it seems and not God's kingdom. And I think when you know somebody's name, but you don't really know what their church is or what their church stands for, but you're following a person, they are in danger of becoming, gaining their own glory and not giving it to God. God puts everybody in every set of Authority. It continues in verse 2. Why should the nations, those out there, say, where is their God? So why should people out there come to us and say, where's your God? Because our God is in the heavens and he does all that he pleases. The idea that God is in the heavens and this is something that you need to understand in your heart. God is in the heavens... And he does all that he pleases. What is God doing today? God is doing all that he pleases. Everything that he wants to do, he does. Everything that pleases him, he does. And nobody is slowing him down. Nobody is stopping him. And the, the idea that God is evident in the world is why it becomes a rhetorical question. Why should anybody ask us, where is your God? And I think people today don't really ask that. It seems that people just say, I don't believe in God, and they think that gives them a pass. But if anybody asks you, where is your God, especially in these difficult times, that if your God was doing things, perhaps COVID wouldn't be the way that it is, your answer can be, God, my God is in the heavens and he's doing all that he pleases. Not some that he pleases, not one or two things that he pleases, but all that he pleases. And then the middle section of this psalm is a, is a polemic against idols. A polemic is a curse if you pray for the disciples, when they were coming against, uh, walking past Samaria, they asked Jesus if they should call fire down from heaven upon them. And Jesus said, no, we don't work that way. That request was a polemic request. They were asking God to curse somebody. When I pray for God to hurt somebody, 
that is a polemic. It is a curse. This is a polemic, and I don't do that. You don't pray for people to be hurt. You pray for people to be saved by whatever means God wants to use, but you don't pray for God to curse people. God is not, this psalm is not asking God to curse people. It's actually asking God to curse pieces of wood and pieces of metal, the idols. It says, their idols are silver and gold, the work of human hands. They have mouths but do not speak, eyes but do not see. They have ears but do not see, noses but do not smell. They have hands but do not feel, feet but do not walk. And they do not make a sound in their throat. In other words, they're nothing. The longest polemic against idols, and many people think that this author took this from Isaiah 8. Isaiah 8, he's actually mocking idol makers and mocking people who bow down to idols. He says, you go cut down a tree. Half of it you put in the fire so you can cook your lunch. The other half of it you carve into a statue and you bow down to it. Shouldn't be that way. We don't worship wood. As the Bible is clear, the one true and living God, the one we worship, cannot be represented. The second in the Ten Commandments, no graven images, don't make Images of animals, don't make images of people, and call it God. God is so far beyond our understanding, so far beyond our imagination. We can never artistically carve out something and have it truthfully represent God. It will always degrade him, and therefore it's always blasphemous. And so wherever the Bible talks about idols, it is always saying... It's a bad thing. Christians don't do it. Old Testament people don't do it. We do not worship idols. Pictures of Jesus, we can debate that, but don't bow down to a picture of Jesus. If you want to have an image, we have a cross, big old cross up there that is a symbol of what Jesus had done. If you look at our stained glass, we have no people. Uh, we have Alpha and Omega, and we have the communion symbols and things like that. We have symbols of Christianity, but no people, no faces, no images that are here. We have a cross that is empty of Christ because we, re- we worship the risen Christ. There are people out there who have statues, your Catholic, your Orthodox We'll have statues and paintings. Yeah, it's dangerous. Don't bow down to them. The only religion that requires idols today is the Hindus. If you go to a Hindu temple, it will be full of statues and people are actually bowing down to them. They are the only idol worshippers left in the world today. There are some Buddhist sects who will bow down to a statue of Buddha As they pray, they'll say they're not an idol worshiper, that it's just a remembrance or something. But hey, there's a statue, you're bowing down to it. I'll call that idol worship. We don't do it. Christians do not do it. Anybody who is doing it, this psalm says it's silly. It serves no purpose because they don't do anything for you. And then it concludes those who make them become like them, in other words, deaf, dumb, and mute, because the, there's nothing in them that they become empty if they are worshiping the empty. So we do not worship idols, and anywhere the Bible talks about idols, it is always in a negative sense. Then the psalm in 9 through 11 goes through a repeated part Trust in the Lord, he is their help and their shield, is repeated three times. It is verse said to, O Israel, then it is said to the house of Aaron. Israel is the nation or the country of Israel. House of Aaron is the priests. Anybody who is a priest, they don't have those anymore. But anybody who was a priest, this was a command to them. And then something that can be given to us, all you who fear the Lord, 
trust in the Lord. He is their help and their shield. And we need to be people who fear the Lord. We need to be the type of people who take God seriously, who take God seriously in whatever we do. Understand that, yes, He's watching. And yes, what we do in His presence matters to Him. And so the idea that we are people who fear the Lord, we need to trust in the Lord. He is our help and our shield. He is someone who comes alongside and someone who protects us. We trust in the Lord and we trust in the Lord versus, for example, trusting in an idol or trusting in a 401k or the stock market or a politician Anything on earth that you can put your trust in, you're not supposed to. You're supposed to put your trust in the Lord exclusively. I trust the Lord for all that I'm doing as I'm I'm working at the church, as I'm looking at an investment, as I'm considering who to vote for, all these sorts of decisions... I trust the Lord in this. I trust the Lord that he will guide me. I trust the Lord that he will make money available when I finally need it to do things. I trust God, not the government, not the stock market, not even my neighbor, to do the right thing all the time. I trust God. And so I show that by, for example... Praying about every decision I make, I pray through things. When I see something that is difficult, I hear news about about China cracking down on Hong Kong, a very harsh, difficult thing that's going on. I trust God and I pray that the missionaries that are in Hong Kong, and there are a lot of missionaries in Hong Kong from all over the world, that they will continue to present the gospel and that through this time of great persecution of a people, the word of God will rise up and will convert people and that you may see a revival. I mean, these are the types of things I pray when I see news about it. I don't get worried. I don't wring my hands. I pray that God will, you know, work his way through it and in it, in the cracks of that system and get his word out, and the most valuable thing that could happen in China is for President Xi to become a Christian. Yeah, that's never going to happen. Hey, you're not trusting God. (laughs) See, if you trust God, then you trust God, and you know he's in his heavens, and he's doing all that he pleases. So I pray that it will please God to save that guy, and that maybe that will slow things down a bit. Now, God's doing whatever he wants, so I don't demand that God does that, but I do pray for it. I pray for the salvation of pretty much any world leader whose name comes across my desk in a news story. I pray for their salvation. I pray for their strength. I pray that countries will send bold missionaries into places like China and places like Saudi Arabia and Indonesia where they'll kill you if you have a Bible that God will call and send missionaries to go and get people saved. It says, the Lord has remembered us. He will bless us. He will bless the house of Israel. He will bless the house of Aaron. He will bless those who fear the Lord. So if I trust in God, if I believe he's my help and my shield, then the response is that God will bless me. And for God to bless me means he favors me means he only does good things to me, at me, near me, with me. That God's cursing program is not on me. You can't be blessed and cursed at the same time. And as I said before, everybody on earth today is either being blessed or cursed by God. There's no neutrality. There's no waiting. Everybody is actively being blessed or cursed by God at this moment in time. I want to be someone who's blessed by God. I want to trust God. And in his response, he will bless me and he will bless this church. And I think that is something that we can work for. I think that's something 
that we can stand on when we talk about standing on a rock and that the storm comes. Well, today, what's the storm? Well, today the storm is COVID and riots and looting and political discord and hate and persecution. This is kind of the storm we're in today, and you can either stand on a politician. I'm going to stand on a politician. Well, that politician is sad, and when the storm comes, you're not going to be standing on anything. You stand on God, and strange things. See, the God who wrote this so long ago is the rock you can stand on today, and this says... God's going to bless me if I fear him. And it says he will bless those who fear the Lord, both small and great. Small and great is both size. The words there could mean size, or it could mean stature, or it could mean value. There is no famous person in God's eyes. There's no rich person in God's eyes. There's no person who's prettier than somebody else, who's more valuable than somebody else. Whatever we are in our own eyes, God does save both the great and the small. The Bible says he's not a respecter of persons. You can't bring anything to God and say, ah, look at me, look at me. He'll go, I have seen it before. Both small and great, God will save. And you are somewhere in small or great or somewhere in between. And that means God can also save you. It says, may the Lord give you increase, you and your children. The plan in the Jewish economy is that if parents really, really, really followed God, that their children would learn that. It isn't a guarantee of Scripture. The most godly parents in the world can have very rebellious kids. It's just how the world is built today. But it's a, it's a general teaching. It's a better idea for parents to teach their kids about God. The heavens are the Lord's heavens, but the earth he has given to the children of men. The dead do not praise the Lord. No, do any who go down to silence. We do not wait for somebody else to praise the Lord. We do not wait for those who came before to praise the Lord. If somebody has gone to glory... They can no longer praise the Lord here. And if everybody else is gone, you still need to be one who praises God. If nobody else is praising God, you still need to be the person who is praising God, who is trusting, who is not taking his glory from him, but is giving him all the glory that he is due. And it ends with, but we will bless the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. Praise the Lord. We favor God. We take him seriously, not just on Sundays, not just during Bible studies, but this day forth and evermore. We don't see people like Martin Luther praising God, but he is. He's in the presence of God and we can't see him praising God So we are left to praise here. But I assure you, when you go to glory, you'll be standing right alongside all the Christians you heard about before, praising God, both great and small, and everybody in between. We are people who praise God. We are people when glory is offered, we don't seek it, we give it to God. I want to end each day by saying... I really worked to expand the kingdom of God. I really worked to advance the name of God in the world. I want to be a person who can go to bed at night understanding that I did not glorify myself, that people out there do not know my name, but they know God's name, and they know God's name, and generation after generation after generation, until Jesus Christ comes back again, We continue telling the truth, expanding the kingdom of God, getting people saved. That is the point of why we are here. That is why God saved you, so that other people could be saved. Let us pray. Lord God Almighty, I just praise you that you have shown us 
that you get all the glory, that when it's all said and done, if I get glory, it buys me nothing. But if I give you glory, if like King Henry V, I can say every day, not to me, O Lord, not to me, but to your name, I give glory. Lord, I pray that you would teach us that to our very core. Help us to understand that there is no glory that is for me, but it is all for you. Lord, I praise you for that, and as your blessing on the remainder of the day, I ask all this in the blood of Christ. Amen. Cornerstone Fellowship is located at 180 Llewellyn Boulevard, San Lorenzo, California. Our Sunday morning service is at 1045 a.m. Our website is livingfreetoday.org and our phone number is 510-278-2622. May God continue to bless you as you serve your King. God bless.